Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining me. I've been looking forward to this presentation and it's amazing to me that we're able to reach out and share ideas across this sort of distance using this sort of technology. And the fact that we can do this in the middle of a global crisis is not only testimony to the technology but also the resilience of the human condition. I'd like to thank Merck for making this evening possible and uh, I draw your attention to the fact that they, are, uh, they have a disclaimer and I have no conflicts of interest. There are a couple of goals for this evening and broadly we're going to look at the function of LH and how that pertains to driving ovarian steroidogenesis during controlled ovarian stimulation. In addition, we're going to have a look at its structure, and understanding its structure really gives us insight into its metabolism, its half-life, the elimination, and the post-receptor response that we see. And we will be able to contrast this with HCG, understanding and appreciating that they have similar roles, they share the same receptor, but they are vastly different from one another. And in addition to that, we're then going to look at the patients who surprise us the ovarian hyper-responders. These are patients who, by all prediction models, should have done much better. They have normal ovarian reserve tests. Their AMHs are great, but they don't perform so well. And in so doing, we'll highlight some of the, the shortfalls of our current prediction models, and we'll be able to look at that and understand perhaps the role of pharmacogenetics in better understanding ovarian hyper-response. And lastly, I hope that we will walk away understanding better where LH will benefit our patients during ovarian stimulation. So very briefly, if we look at the physiology of ovarian stimulation and where LH fits in, it really is in driving the androgen synthesis in the theca cells. And we know that LH binding will, at the theca cell level, will activate the delta-5 pathway, which takes us from cholesterol to eventually uh, testosterone and androstenedione, uh, which are the two androgen substrates for aromatization into estrogen within the granulosa cells. So this theca-derived substrate really is uh, the rate-limiting step for estrogen synthesis. And we need to understand which patients require additional LH and who will have sufficient levels of LH without requiring any substitution during stimulation. When it comes to the structure of LH, we know that it's a heterodimer. It consists of an alpha and a beta subunit, and both of these are glycoproteins. Uh, the alpha subunit of both uh, LH, FSH, TSH, and HCG are all identical, and coded for by a single gene on chromosome 6. Now the beta subunits of each of these molecules confer specificity and function, but it's important to realize that the protein backbones, if you like, the amino acid sequences, are not where the function lies. It's actually in the carbohydrate moieties, in other words, the carboxylation. And we really need to understand that in terms of the difference between LH and uh, HCG. The more carbohydrate groups you have, the more glycosylation you have, uh, the longer the half-life. In addition to that, these carbohydrate groups can be further modified by the addition of sialic acid, which will further enhance uh, the half-life, or through sulfonation, which will reduce the half-life and increase the elimination. Now if we look at these simplified molecular diagrams showing the alpha and the beta chains, we can see how LH above has a single N-glycosylation site on the, on the beta subunit, uh, whereas HCG has two N-glycosylation uh, sites and four O-glycosylation sites. Now remember, we said that glycosylation adds to the half-life. It basically reduces the serum or plasma elimination, and, uh, which would normally occur in the liver and the kidneys. In addition to that, LH has one to two sialic acid residues, which also promote uh, a longer half-life, but HCG has 20. And so we start to understand that 
functionally they are similar, they bind the similar receptor, but their metabolism is completely different. Now it's interesting that the differences between LH and HCG do not stop simply at their elimination and half-lives, but in the post-receptor effect. They share a common receptor, but it would appear that the LH-HCG receptor can act differentially depending on what is binding it. And certainly we know that HCG is five times more potent than LH in terms of the cyclic AMP levels measured in the intracellular compartment. What is interesting though is the way they reach these peak levels is completely different. So the post-receptor kinetics differ vastly. If we look at LH, it attains maximum cyclic AMP levels within 10 minutes of receptor binding. This is extremely rapid. HCG, with a longer half-life, takes much longer to get to its five times higher cyclic AMP level. In fact, it takes a full 60 minutes. Uh, so the post receptor kinetics of the cyclic AMP and, and following on that the pyruvate kinase uh, signaling takes place at completely different rates for both of these enzymes. So really I, I would call this slide the, the usual suspects. There's no surprises here. We've got three commercially available uh, products with LH or LH-like activity provided either through recombinant LH or through HCG. We're going, to, we're going to start off with human menopausal gonadotropin, HMG, and this has been around uh, since the 1960s commercially, and uh, it's purified from uh, postmenopausal uh, urine. And initially when they started off, uh, the, the purity was fairly low, and you can see there at the bottom of the slide, less than 5%. And as this purification process has improved, a highly purified HMG became available commercially in about 1990. And this allowed for a subcutaneous administration rather than intramuscular administration. It's important to appreciate that the LH activity in HMG is driven by HCG. And as we've just shown, this is slightly different in its post-receptor kinetics. In terms of the FSH-LH ratio, we know that it's a one-to-one -one ratio, 75 units of international units of each. And uh, in terms of uh, the purification process, we know that most of that HCG uh, or LH-like activity uh, is from purification, although sometimes additional HCG is added. The first recombinant product that we're going to be discussing is recombinant LH or lutropin alpha. And that became available on the market in about 2000, and largely because of uh, work in the uh, recombinant genetics. And so a plasmid vector is used to introduce the LH gene into a host cell, and in, in this case uh, it's the Chinese hamster ovary cell line, which is used for all the recombinant gonadotropin products. The big difference is really in the purity of the final product. There is simply no batch-to-batch -batch or vial-to-vial -vial consistency issues. Uh, we're not relying on a different donor or a different uh, urinary collection here. The process is extremely regimented. And this is really reflected in the purity. You can see there more than 99% pure. I'm reminding you that the original HMG product was less than 5% pure. And even highly purified HMG is less than 70% purified product. So in terms of biological activity, we've got a very high biological activity with a very low protein content. The last product to enter the market from the recombinant side, of course, uh, was a combination of uh, folytropin alpha and lutropin alpha. And uh, that was launched in 2007. And... Uh, the combination, the ratio of FSH to LH is 2 to 1 as opposed to HMG, which is a 1 to 1 ratio. And again, because of the process uh, in terms of the production, there is a great consistency from batch to batch and also from vial to vial. Uh, we're aware of the fact that in a natural cycle, uh, 
FSH works within a threshold or between a threshold and a ceiling. Uh, so there's a therapeutic window for follicular recruitment. What's important to realize is that in a stimulation cycle, there seems to be a therapeutic window for LH. We know that LH activity below 75 international units is inefficient in driving ovarian steroidogenesis in hypogonadotropic patients. And if the levels go above 225, we start to see uh, a counterintuitive effect. In fact, we have uh, more apoptosis of um, developing follicles. So we really need to keep between somewhere between 75 and 225, but we'll talk about that now. In stimulation cycles, when we use GnRH analogs, we induce pituitary downregulation and a relative hypogonadotrophic state. So the question is, who needs LH then? Is it for everyone or is it for a select subgroup? And up until now, it's really been felt that the resting levels of LH should be sufficient to drive the ovarian steroidogenesis in normogonadotrophic patients who are ovulatory. So, and the reason for this is that we need only 1% of LH receptors to be occupied in order to adequately drive ovarian steroidogenesis in terms of the androgen biosynthesis. So we don't need a very high serum value. So who definitely needs LH during their stimulation? And we're quite happy to give LH to the hypogonadotrophic patients. And then in the normal gonadotrophic patients, there are two groups. And those are essentially the women over the age of 35 and those who have shown a hyper-response to recombinant FSH monotherapy. And it's important to realize that hyper-response and poor response are two separate and completely disassociated uh, states. Looking at the therapeutic window for recombinant LH in hypogonadotrophic patients, um, they've seen that, as I've mentioned, at least 75 international units of recombinant LH are required in addition to recombinant FSH to allow for follicular genesis and adequate estrogen synthesis. Uh, without this LH activity, if we go below that level, we start to have a reduction in estrogen levels and inefficient follicular genesis. Of course, one would say, well, if we increase this, will we get an increased response? And the answer is yes, but only to a point. So it would appear that perhaps 150 units of recombinant LH has an advantage over 75 units. But once we get to 225 international units daily of recombinant LH, we are actually going backwards. And that's associated with follicular atresia and paradoxically a reduction in the estrogen levels. In this era of evidence-based medicine, uh, we feel that meta-analysis and review will guide us, but sometimes the evidence is conflicting. And if we look at the Cochrane data uh, regarding the place for recombinant LH in ovarian stimulation, it really appears that there is no value in an unselected general IVF population for recombinant LH. Now this has led to a lot of dissatisfaction amongst authors who feel that perhaps the older patient was not properly represented in this data. And we know that many of the studies which they included had an average age of between 32 and 33. Now if we look at global trends to delayed maternity, and certainly if we look at IVF trends internationally for women seeking to, uh, to have their first child, more than 50% are over the age of 35. So really, the Cochrane data does not speak to the vast majority of patients seeking to conceive for the first time in IVF units globally. And in this older patient group, there seems to definitely be a benefit. As you can see in this slide, in studies specifically looking at women over the age of 35, the addition of recombinant LH is associated with significant uh, improvements in outcome. 
And what's important here is the higher implantation rate is nearly one and a half times higher when we compare women above the age of 36 who receive recombinant LH compared to those who receive FSH monotherapy alone. In addition, this is associated with a higher ongoing pregnancy rate, again almost one and a half times. It's important to show that that higher implantation rate was statistically significant, um, although the pregnancy rate did not reach statistical significance in this particular study. Again, in a pooled meta-analysis and systemic review of stimulation cycles in women above the age of 35, it appears that recombinant LH is associated with a lower cumulus oocyte complex yield. So in other words, you get less eggs, but it appears that the quality of those eggs is improved. Not only that, it appears that there is a positive effect on the endometrial receptivity in fresh embryo transfer cycles. And this translates into a higher implantation rate uh, with an odds ratio of 1.3 and a higher pregnancy rate of also an odds ratio of 1.3. And we can see there that both of those are significant. So the take home message here is when you're looking to stimulate patients above the age of 35, LH most definitely has a place. I've already alluded to ovarian hyper response and, uh, and poor ovarian response as being two distinct entities. And up until now we've had a very limited prediction model for how a patient will respond to ovarian stimulation. And some may argue that in actual fact the stimulation is really the only means of accurately predicting how a patient's going to respond to gonadotropins. But we know that age antral follicle count, AMH, uh, and looking at underlying risk factors may give us some indication of how a woman is likely to respond. In addition, previous ovarian response in a stimulation cycle obviously gives us a great insight into their potential for the future. So how good are our prediction models of ovarian response or ovarian reserve testing, if you want to and we know that the antral follicle count and AMH have been ratified as probably being the best, the most accurate, the most reflective of a patient's response to stimulation. They're considered to be the most specific and sensitive, but it's important to know that they're not perfect. We know that the antral follicle count can vary depending on uh, where the patient is in her, and certainly from cycle to cycle, we see a significant variability in the recruitable uh, cohort of FSH-sensitive follicles which are detectable by transvaginal ultrasound. AMH appears to be probably a more stable uh, ovarian reserve test, um, although both are associated with a false positive rate of between 10 and 20 percent. And uh, as I've mentioned, AMH seems to be constant from cycle to cycle, whereas even B and uh, antral follicle count tend to vary quite considerably from one cycle to the other. Now what are some risk factors that we can look out for just in our patient's history in terms of uh, poor ovarian response, particularly in younger women? And we must always be mindful of the role of mutations and pre-mutations and uh, certainly Turner's syndrome is associated with premature ovarian uh, failure or complete ovarian failure and, uh, and the fragile X pre-mutation is also something which can test for in patients with a poor response at a very young age. Something we see very often, tubal factor infertility itself can be a marker for someone that may not respond adequately to ovarian stimulation. And we've seen that poor response can be associated with positive chlamydial testing. I think it's self-evident that any ovarian surgery or ovarian endometriomas can affect ovarian response. And we know that the more we operate in the ovary, the more chance there is for damage and uh, a falling 
not only antral follicle count AMH, but also ovarian response. Chemotherapy, particularly the alkylating agents, is particularly toxic for primordial germ cells. And we see accelerated loss of the primordial germ cell pool, and certainly a greatly reduced ovarian ability to respond. So in terms of ovarian hyporesponse, what are we talking about? These are the patients who surprise us. They're the patients who don't keep us awake before the stimulation, but who keep us awake after the stimulation. And the reason is we expected them to do well. Their antral follicle count, their AMH, even their age, may have all pointed towards an appropriate ovarian response. But they show a suboptimal response, despite normal ovarian reserve testing. And very often you can see this in the stimulation. They are slow to get out of the starting blocks. We see a slow follicular recruitment, really slow follicular growth. By stimulation day six, usually the follicles are still below 10 millimeters in average diameter. We see low serum estradiol levels on, on day six. And generally, we end up using far higher doses of FSH or a longer stimulation or a combination of these which reflects their inherent resistance to the effects of FSH. And it's important to realize that these patients have an inherent resistance, either at a receptor level or even in a, at a, at a um, LH beta subunit level, which we'll get to now. And they cannot be identified using our normal prediction tests. The first attempt to describe poor ovarian response or discriminate between poor ovarian response and ovarian hyper response was given to us through the Poseidon consensus group. And if we have a look at this slide, we can see the groups one and two are predicted uh, to respond well in terms of their uh, ovarian reserve testing. We're talking about an antral follicle count above five and an AMH above 1.2 nanograms per mole. Groups three and four are actually predicted to respond poorly. Um, and then these are stratified according to age. Now, while the Poseidon classification goes a long way to understanding how someone responded to an ovarian stimulation, there's still room for improvement. And so we can look at a couple of newer, perhaps, and more functional assessments of ovarian response to stimulation. The first of these is the FORT or follicular output rate and this is really described as the ratio of the pre-trigger follicles, those measured on the day of HCG or uh, Lucrin trigger, larger than 16 millimeters, expressed as a ratio of the antral follicles visible on the first day of stimulation. And uh, so we can see in the slide the difference between a low fort and high fort because egg number does not really mean anything if we don't understand what the potential of that patient was to respond. Another means of quantifying ovarian response to stimulation is by factoring in the quantity, the total amount of FSH used and dividing that by the number of retrieved oocytes. And this is known as the ovarian sensitivity index. The last measure is known as the FOI, or follicle oocyte index. And this looks at the number of retrieved oocytes expressed as the number of antral follicles at the baseline scan. So this is a modification of, of the fort. And the only real concern that we have with FOI as a measure of response to stimulation is that it not only requires stimulation but it also takes into account technical aspects such as the trigger, the response to the trigger, the timing of the OPU or the, or the oocyte pickup in relation to the trigger and also technical challenges at the OPU itself. If there wasn't access to an ovary, an ovary which is stuck to the posterior uh, uterus or a myoma which prevents access to an ovary can all affect 
the FOI. So we, we do appreciate that this is not entirely the response only to the stimulation, but also to the pickup itself and the trigger. What all these various measures of patient response to stimulation show is that really we are dissatisfied at this point in time in the way in which patients who were predicted to respond well haven't. And we're really grappling with that. And so we are ready for the next exciting addition to the possible tools we can use in predicting how a patient will respond to our therapy. So whenever patients surprise us, it concerns us because we don't feel in control. And for doctors, that's usually quite alarming. Uh, for the rest of the world, it's just another day. And we need to appreciate that giving a standard dose, albeit based on age, ovarian reserve testing, we cannot expect a standard response. That's, that's naive. And in actual fact, we know that at least 20% of patients won't respond exactly the way they were predicted, even if they were predicted to have a normal response. We're talking about healthy, normal gonadotrophic patients who, with recombinant FSH alone, show a hyper response. And what this shows is that patients differ in their genetic susceptibility or ability to respond to a particular therapy. It's essential to understand that the efficacy of a drug and its toxicity does not lie solely with the drug, it lies with the patient's genetic predisposition. And very often these genetic predispositions exist as uh, polymorphisms which have no phenotypic trait. However, they can be unmasked by a pharmacological challenge. And in this particular case, we're talking about stimulation. So what's the difference between a polymorphism and a mutation? Well, really it's a semantics, but if the frequency of a mutation is more than 1% in the general population, then it's termed a polymorphism. And this is the basis for individuality. And in fact, if we look at the variability within the human genome, about 85% is explained through polymorphisms. We have over 3 billion base pairs, which code for something like 20 to 25,000 genes. And for each 2,000 base pairs, there is a single nucleotide polymorphism. That's why I look the way you do, or I look the way I do, and you look the way you do. And uh, not only that, these go unnoticed for most of the time. Like I mentioned, there's no phenotypic effect except when they are exposed through drug therapy. Now the first polymorphism that can affect a patient's response to FSH is a polymorphism at the level of the FSH receptor. And we know there are two sites which can be involved. One at site 307, threonine gets uh, substituted for alanine, or at the 608 position uh, where we have an we know that it's at codon position 680 where asparagine is converted to serine where we have the receptor polymorphism which is associated with a re resistance to the effects of FSH during stimulation. And in fact homozygous 680 serine serine patients are the ones who show the hyper response. Typically these patients will require higher doses of FSH during the stimulation, a much longer stimulation that will show a slow follicular recruitment, a slow response, um, and generally lower serum estrogen levels. Now the question is, how important is this? Um, it all sounds very new, uh, and it may not be relevant for me, stimulating my patients. The answer is that up to 20% of the general IVF population may experience a hyper response as a result of an FSH receptor polymorphism. That's one in five and that is relevant.
it doesn't end with the FSH receptor. There is a polymorphism involving the beta unit of LH, the beta LH. And this is associated with a significantly shorter half-life than the wild type LH. So 26 minutes as opposed to an average of 46 minutes. And this increased uh, LH metabolism in these patients alters the requirement for FSH during stimulation. So they also present uh, as hyper-responders, but are genetically dissimilar. And um, in this group of patients, their basal levels of LH have been shown to be up to twice normal. And in actual fact, they will most definitely benefit from the substitution of exogenous LH during their stimulation. You may be asking, well, how common is this particular condition? And I'm going to show you now. So if we look at this graph together, it's a little busy um, with this table, but you can see the frequencies within different populations will determine whether or not you think pharmacogenetics is for you or not. Even in the United States, within different populations or population groups within the United States, we see a doubling in the rates of V-beta-LH uh, polymorphism. And certainly in Sweden, Finland, the rates actually go up from 20% to up to 40% of the population. So in these areas, it's essential to know what the rates of the polymorphism are in your population and whether or not that will require you to screen not only your donors, which we'll get to later, but perhaps the patients coming for stimulation. So how do we approach patients who've had a hyper response? Um, I think the first thing is to appreciate what a hyper response is. When you've had a patient who was predicted to have a poor response, they have an AMH less than five, or an antral follicle count less than five, an AMH less than 1.2, and they don't respond well, particularly if the AMH is severely reduced. I'm talking about the less than 0.5 group. Additional stimulation is not going to improve the outcome. What the ovary is giving us is all the ovary is capable of giving us, and that's the poor response group. The hyper response group are capable of far more, and for them it is implicit that we improve their response by changing our medication. So can you improve the outcome in hyper responders simply by adding more FSH? And the answer is yes, you can. You can actually overcome FSH polymorphism driven receptor resistance by simply just increasing the dose of recombinant FSH. So you will save the cohort, but you will sacrifice the endometrium. And it's important to realize as you're adding FSH, you are driving the uh, delta four pathway within the granulosa cells. And the ultimate product of that is progesterone. So we see that if you add recombinant FSH to a hyperresponder, as you increase that dose, so you will increase the serum progesterone level. And in a fresh cycle, certainly, this will place you in a position where your endometrium may, may suffer from premature luteinization and the asynchrony between your endometrium and your embryo may be increased and this will translate into lower implantation rates. So in a freeze-all cycle, this is not really a consideration, but certainly in a fresh cycle, uh, you would be wise to bear this in mind. Now our other option is to add recombinant LH to the hyper-responders. And the, answer, the question is really, how does this uh, compare to just increasing the FSH? And we know that if we add the LH, we will have more retrieved oocytes, we will have more mature oocytes, we will have a higher implantation and pregnancy rate, and we will have a lower miscarriage rate. And that's testimony not only to improved oocyte quality, but also an improved endometrial receptivity. When we're adding recombinant LH to hyperresponders, the real question is, how much is enough? And we know there's a therapeutic window. There's a ceiling effect 
or recombinant LH above the level of 225 international units a day. But up until fairly recently, we haven't really known is 75 sufficient, is more perhaps better? And the answer is plain to see. 150 units is probably superior to 75 units per day in terms of recombinant LH supplementation in hyperresponders. And we see an increased number of metaphase 2 oocytes, in other words, mature oocytes, and we see a higher pregnancy rate in the group receiving 150 units as opposed to the 75. What about downregulation? What sort of pituitary su su suppression do we have? Will the baseline or resting levels of LH be sufficient to drive steroidogenesis? And is there a subgroup of patients who will have inefficient or insufficient ovarian steroidogenesis? And the answer is, of course, yes. Now, how do we identify them? Two studies have looked at this, and the first looked at a, a cycle day 8 LH value of less than 0.5 international units per liter as being their cutoff for low serum LH. And what they found to their amazement in 200 normogonadotrophic predicted normal responders, that half of these patients had a low LH as measured on day 8. What's even more alarming is that when they went on to do a fresh transfer, the miscarriage rate in this group was five times higher. Now, day eight of the stimulation is quite late, so we'd like to look a little earlier. And other studies have shown that if you do a baseline LH and it's below one international unit per liter, those patients will probably do better in a stimulation if LH is added. So if you do a baseline LH of less than one, that would be the group to consider adding LH to. Now we know in antagonist cycles, there's an immediate and dose-dependent suppression of pituitary LH. And uh, in these groups of patients, uh, there may be place for LH supplementation. And studies that have looked at this have shown that LH is associated with an improved implantation rate, uh, odds ratio 1.5, and an improved ongoing pregnancy rate of 1.49. These are quite significant. Now it's important to realize that that is for the older patient group. And what I mean by that is women above the age of 36, as we've discussed. Now, what else could affect pituitary suppression or downregulation? And we know that the oral contraceptive pill, which is used by many of us to program our patients, may have a role in modifying the pituitary response and certainly modifying the baseline or resting levels of LH. So what evidence is there? Well, we do know why we use the pill, and we know what it results in. So it allows us greater plasticity in, in terms of our logistics to range our patients and their stimulation cycles. So from a programming point of view, it's quite useful. It also increases the synchrony of the cohort, and that's because we have a reduction in the baseline FSH of the patient, and so it closes the window, it narrows that window of FSH responsiveness so we, we have a much more cohesive cohort at the beginning of a stimulation. However, we know that we're probably going to use more gonadotropins and our stimulation time will be longer in these patients. So what does the Cochrane say? And in agonist cycles, uh, the data differs from that of antagonist cycles. So in the antagonist cycles, we see that there's a lower ongoing pregnancy rate, uh, a lower live birth rate, and a higher miscarriage rate. So there is a cost to using the oral contraceptive in the antagonist cycle. Paradoxically, in the long agonist cycle, it appears that patients who have received pretreatment with the oral contraceptive pull have a lower miscarriage rate with an odds ratio of about 0.4. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear 
that there's any evidence for the role of LH or, or no LH, FSH monotherapy, in patients pre-programmed with a pill. So that requires further study. Now when we think of other situations in which gonadotropin levels at baseline may be different in our patients, we have to consider body mass index. And when we talk about BMI and fertility, we usually are talking about obesity and about weight loss. But we have to appreciate that while overweight and obese patients have a profound uh, negative impact on their fertility, the extremes of BMI, in other words, underweight patients, with a BMI of less than 18.5 kilograms per square meter, also have reduced fertility outcomes. And this needs to be uh, certainly addressed. Just generally, a lower body mass index is associated with lower levels of leptin, and these have been associated with lower implantation rates and higher rates of miscarriage, and overall, a lower birth rate. So we know that leptin is produced in adipose tissue and it correlates almost directly with the degree of adiposity of the patient. And that endometrial leptin expression determines uh, implantation. And more than that, leptin acts to regulate LH, estradiol, and it has an effect on the hypothalamus. And interestingly, animal studies have shown that in hypogonadotrophic leptin-deficient mice who were treated with leptin alone, not only restored their ovulation, but also their reproductive function. So leptin is key in this entire uh, interplay between the low body mass index patient and the picture in terms of response to stimulation. This brings me to probably a, a point of controversy. That is, is there a place for LH in PCOS-like patients? And I say PCOS-like because we're not talking about the stein leventhal pursuit, overweight, anovulatory patient. We're talking about the underweight, anovulatory patient who shows no signs of... Um, hyperandrogenism, but who does have anovulation, it's important to realize in this subgroup of patients who have high AMHs, high antral follicle counts, who are predicted to be hyperresponders, that their anovulation probably does not lie at the level of a raised LH and an inability to select for follicular dominance, but rather an inherently low FSH level and an inability to reach the threshold for the recruitable cohort. And so these patients really represent more of a hypogonadotrophic picture than they do a polycystic picture. We have seen that stimulation without LH is associated with a poor outcome in these patients and certainly substituting LH activity in their stimulation cycles at the very least from cycle day six, but in some cases earlier, depending on their body mass, may be beneficial. So should we be offering recombinant LH or LH activity to donors who are being stimulated? We know that these represent the cream of the crop. They have been pre-selected, they've been screened on their age, their antral follicle count, their AMH, uh, and their body mass index. So they really represent an ideal group of normal responders and yet if we were offering frozen cycles or frozen donor eggs to recipient couples that would be one thing uh, because in this case we would know what the outcome of the ovarian stimulation had been and we would be offering them a product which we already were able to deliver however in a fresh stimulation we only know how many eggs we're going to get on the day of retrieval and no one likes surprises. Now if we consider that the FSH polymorphism can occur in up to 20% of the general population, including the donor population, 
And if we consider that the V beta LH polymorphism can occur in anything from 7 to 40% of the population, depending on where you stay, you may want to consider in your fresh donor cycles adding LH to avoid a hyper response. And in these predicted normal responders, possibly supplementing the LH from stimulation day six would offer an advantage and certainly it would reduce the number of cycles where you have a poor response uh, in a predicted normal responder. So in summary, i just like to drive home a couple of points. Uh, LH and HCG act through the same receptor, but they are structurally and functionally different. Their elimination and their half-lives differ. Their post-receptor kinetics are worlds apart. And one really needs to appreciate that. We know that there are three groups of patients who most definitely require LH. Those are the hypogonadotrophic patients, the women above the age of 35, and the hyper-responders. It appears that LH has a threshold and a ceiling. Values below 75 international units daily are probably insufficient to drive sufficient steroidogenesis, and values above 225 probably are deleterious and have the opposite effect to what we're looking to achieve. Up to 20% of the patients that you predict by traditional means of age, androphilic account, AMH, will surprise you in a way which will not make you happy. So they will have a hyper response and one has to be aware of that, one has to be alert to that possibility and where possible predict that. And that is the new or a new field for us, the pharmacogenetics. And in these hyper-responders, by adding FSH, we will save the cohort, but at the cost of sacrificing the endometrium. So for fresh cycles, this really wouldn't be a good choice. For frozen cycles, it probably doesn't make too much of a difference. If we add LH to the hyper-responders, we will restore the follicular number without raising serum progesterone and without reducing endometrial receptivity. It's been a long evening and I'd like to thank you for your attention and again thank Merck for this opportunity. We'll now open for questions and answers and uh, the floor is yours.